spells lollipop. <laughs> Why don't you just go hand out parking tickets and leave me alone? Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> you still believe in ghosts, pea brain? Whiskey you possess? Everyone out of the way of the bulldozer! Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, I am never alone when this gentleman is around because he's here. He's one of my heroes. He's our fearless and, dare I say, faultless leader here at Legion Podcasts. Talking to Mr. Bo Ransdell. Hello, Bo. Hey. This is wonderful. Yay. Yeah. That was the reaction I wanted. The the kind of Disney, like, golden era warp in the chest. That's what <laughs> I felt. Yes. Or just a burning in my pancreas. Sometimes I get uh, a little bit of heartburn and I think, oh, is that a bell? <laughs> Not again. Oops, I uh, guess he was getting a stint. Oh, no. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> oh, but yes, <laughs> it's all true, ladies and gentlemen. Over here at the Legion Podcast Network, someone had to take charge, and it was going to be Bo. <laughs> yeah, someone had to do it. I prepared some questions in honor of this momentous occasion. Are there points awarded at any stage of this is this a competition of any kind can i beat someone it's like my teachers used to say it's like okay you all have an a starting at the first day of the semester and each day you screw up we're gonna take and crumble little pieces of that a away until you're all the way down to an f by the first quarter of the semester (laughs) okay okay all right that's a lot of pressure i you know i work well uh, when anxiety is really peaked, as we you're all gonna do. do great. You're yeah. You're gonna do great. Thank you. So I believe it was on a an episode of Pick Six Movies, which, folks, if you're wondering what Pick Six Movies is, don't worry. That's one of the questions. Be patient. <laughs> I believe it was on an episode of Pick Six Mo- Pick Six Movies, where you told a story about the first time you saw Alien the 1979 film, and it was a marvelous story. Would you care to give us the long version? Yeah. Uh, so this is a story that I, I feel like I am telling someone else's story because it was similarly told to me because I was too young to really remember. I have only the faintest of memories of this. And and I that could at this point just be... You know, I had been hypnotized into believing this was true. Inception. <laughs> but uh, at one point, so uh, I, I was <laughs> I was telling my stepmom as I was an older man, um, we were having a conversation about the number of horror movies I watched as a kid. And I said, do you ever think that was a little irresponsible, given the this kind of stuff I was watching? And... This is where the Alien came into the picture, because when Alien was released, I was, uh, what was Alien, 79? So I would have been six around that time. And that was the first movie I ever saw in a theater, to the best of my knowledge, was the original Alien. And she said, look, the problem was, you saw the the preview for this thing, and you wouldn't shut up about it. (laughs) So... The reason we took you to see Alien as a child was out of pure self-defense. It was just to shut you up. <laughs> and I and I said, like, I remember, like, seeing Alien in the theater. I remember having the experience, but not really the details of it. And I, I said, was I scared? Like, I don't remember having nightmares or anything afterwards. She was like, no, no. She was like, you stood up on the chair. And lean forward so that I was kind of like, you know, resting my chin on the chair in front of me. And she was like, you stared at the screen, like uh, practically unblinking. 
just drinking alien in and whether or not that was responsible is a different question but like it never i never flinched and yeah yeah after that i was like oh yeah i guess i I was just broken to begin with you know like that that kind of thing didn't scare me but it was uh I, you know, like, I love that story for so many reasons, not the least of which, um, you know, I, again, I don't have a clear memory of this, but I was in the theater to see Alien when it was first released, and holy shit, if that ain't one of the best movies ever made, and to see it on its original run, whether I recall it or not, that's still pretty cool. You said at the time, in a newspaper article, you were like, this is better than the Blu-ray. Yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing is, recently, somebody th- uh, threw up on Twitter. <laughs> um, <laughs> a uh, It was one of the original TV spots for Alien. And I was trying to kind of forensics my way back and figure out, is that the one that triggered the response? You know, what was the commercial I saw that I was like, yes, I must see that. Father, mother. <laughs> You will get no rest until I see this film, you know? <laughs> so, uh, I don't, I, and I think it might have been that one. It was a, uh, kind of, kind of this, uh, a, a, a TV trailer that was this really, like, flashing imagery kind of thing with an egg cracking open and all kinds of business. It was the kind of thing that I was like, oh, yeah, six year old me would have been like, what in the fuck is this? So, yeah. That is that is the alien story. I love it. So now that you're distinguished and j- jaded, but still very svelte, uh-huh. have any other films created that level of excitement and you sense that moment? Yeah, I I think so. Um, you know, I I think one of the benefits of. Uh, Maybe it, it's just the renaissance in horror we've been having. Maybe it's it, it's just the stage I am, I'm at in my own life or whatever. But I've been real excited about a lot of stuff I've seen recently. Not necessarily um, in an anticipatory way. Like, I don't get... I don't watch a lot of trailers. I don't get super hyped for movies as a rule. Yeah. Um, but I get incredibly excited for movies that I really respond to still. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've said this on any number of, of shows at this point, but, uh, the Robert Eggers, the witch I think is a movie that I, I, I love. It's one of my favorite movies I've ever seen. And that came out, you know, less than 10 years ago. Nice. And, and so, uh, I like being, I I like living a life right where my favorite thing is still something that could not have been made yet. You know, uh, I I don't like to get too fixated on on my my favorite things from childhood, uh, but I do have plenty of those. I'm like I'm as nostalgic as the next guy, but I still get really excited for movies. I thought Spontaneous, uh, which came out last year, I thought that movie was fucking great and was like you know, singing from the rooftops about that one and being like, no, this is like, it's weird and offbeat. And it's one of those movies that unless you're kind of looking for it, it's going to completely miss you. And it's a delight. And yeah, I'm, I missed that. I missed that. I don't think I saw that. It's so good. It's uh, the, the kind of back of the box is it is a story about a young girl falling in love against the backdrop of a high school in which some of the students are spontaneously exploded. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And the characters are wonderful. It's really funny. When you kind of realize what the movie's really about, if you're dumb like me, you're like, oh, wow. Uh, this is this is smarter than I gave it credit for, and and it it's kind of wise in its own way, and I I really just loved it. It's a terrific movie, and and I'm a little bit of a sucker for, you know, the uh, the boy meets girl kind of stuff when it works, and and there's some real chemistry and that kind of thing. So nice, uh, but yeah, yeah. To I mean <laughs> to uh, answer the the question in a much longer way, yes, I there's stuff I get excited about all the time, and. Um, and not just like shitty movies from the seventies where bears attack people, which is still something I get excited. I like, 
I will get excited the next time I watch Grizzly. Like I, I, I get excited the first time I watch Grizzly. Oh, Grizzly is magical. Oh, it's, man. You know, when people are like, you know, my sexual orientation is this. It's like, it's my sexual or- orientation is the movie Grizzly. It is. <laughs> it's a bear being blown up by a bazooka <laughs> by a Vietnam vet helicopter pilot. And a, Which isn't even the best part of the movie. <laughs> right. Right. After Richard <laughs> Jekyll gets gets half murdered by a grizzly, dragged into some pit of shit covered with pine needles, wakes up just to get murdered for real. There was no reason to have that scene <laughs> other than to just rub Richard Jekyll's face in this. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, grizzly is so good. You mentioned not really watching trailers. I'm also, I'm pretty much anti-trailer because trailers to me are a big bummer because they just show everything or the editing of the trailer is whatever trailer editing garbage is now. And so you get turned off to the movie or you know all the beats in the movie because the trailer is three minutes long. Mm -hmm. So I use the first 25 seconds of trailers to see if I'm remotely interested. And then I bail immediately and just make a note to watch this movie later, whatever it is. I never finish a trailer ever. Uh, I watched partly because I, I kind of had to, but I watched that King Kong versus Godzilla trailer to completion. Okay. And, uh, and I kind of felt the same way. I was like, I wish I hadn't watched that now. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I didn't see any berries, and that's got me real bummed out. Oh, I know, I know. If it, Kong ain't, ain't jonesing for berries, then I don't even know what we're doing here, people. Oh, I'm. I thought you meant Kong's berries. No, uh, you didn't see those either. Which again, oh. come on, people. Um, <laughs> what I got to go to the seduction cinema version to see some balls? Is that what's got to <laughs> happen here? Um. But yeah, I and I I'm, for the same reason, and also I'm a little bit like you know I I know what I want to watch. You don't have to sell me. I know like I can tell you by who's in it, who directed it, what the movie's about, whether or not I want to see it. And and I get crotchety when a, a trailer tries to convince me otherwise. Like, how dare you, Jurassic Park trailer? Don't try to convince me this is going to be good. I've seen those other movies. How dare you <laughs> those jurassic world movies are trash anyway <laughs> oh boy yeah oh i was so not that excited in them plenty of people love them yeah and like i i get it i know like again i'm fanboy about plenty of stuff but as a as a grown man watching jurassic world i was like i don't know you guys oh, <laughs> i'm having a real fan of menace flashback here where this maybe isn't as good as well remembered <laughs> They should have called it Jurassic Girl, and it was like a weird, kinky movie. They should have just called it Jurassic Park again, and it should have just been the first movie all over again, just new special effects and stuff. There you go. And, and like, let's forget all this, uh, like, oh, this is the superest of dinosaurs that we made. Well, this one, hey, we, this is one we just made up. That's how evil it is. And... <laughs> You know, and also there's that point where the like the T Rex and the Velociraptors like help each other out and kind of look at each other like they're buddies. Oh yeah, oh, they're like hey guys, some problems. <laughs> Let's learn from our mistakes. <laughs> right, like hey, you know what? At least we were at one point genetically pure, and that's really the message of Jurassic Park is you let let's get rid of all the the mud races of dinosaurs <laughs> dino by these Aryan dinosaurs dinogenics <laughs> yeah yeah they've got a dino solution nice <laughs> so um speaking of imdb which i think stands for inception movie drops bagels that's right but, it, but new real new york bagels is in mm. the asterisk there's a listing of a film called Lost After Dark. Would you uh, like to tell us about your involvement in the film Lost After Dark? Yeah. Uh, so I I wrote that in eh, probably 92, 93, 
293 oh. um, originally. Right. And and the reason was at the time um, that I was not uh, I was not a crazy fan of slashers because they because at, after a while the formula is it gets so rogue and I had seen so many of them that I was kind of fed up. So I wrote Lost After Dark, which or at, at the time you know, was called House on the Hill 2. It was a sequel to a movie that didn't exist. <laughs> nice. I love that. Right. And we were going to do that up until right before we released Lost After Dark. Somebody actually released a movie called House on the Hill. And <sighs> and we were like, fuck. All right. Well, now it just looks like we're a sequel to this movie we've never heard of. So anyway, so that's why Lost After Dark is called Lost After Dark. There is a real scramble to name it. Um so anyway, uh, and and the movie that you see is largely the same, but with a, a few things that were co- kind of substantially different. Um, but basically what happened was I wrote that script as well as a bunch of others, and I was kind of posted them on uh, just message boards and shit for screenwriters that nice. were just like, hey, I'll show you yours if you show you mine. <laughs> show me <laughs> I'll show you mine if you show me yours kind of stuff. And I prefer the other way around. The whatever. I'll show you yours if you show me mine. I'm I going to that. unbuckle your belt and free what's inside, and you'll do the <laughs> same for me, and we'll all have a good time. <laughs> uh, I think is the expression. But I so I, I would just post whatever, right? Like all these, the, the movies that I wrote, because, you know, I was not in LA. I didn't have any connections or anything. So I just put them on the internet and was like, Hey, maybe somebody will see it. And sure enough, somebody did. And I did, uh, Ian, uh, Kessner who directed lost after dark. Um, he had, uh, I wrote a couple of shorts that he was doing. Um, uh, and, and had kind of bounced some ideas off of them. We were looking at a couple of different scripts of mine. Um, that I had posted that he liked and when you know seeing what we could get off the ground and that kind of thing um, weirdly like uh, lost after dark was about the fifth favorite of mine <laughs> you know like there there was other stuff I was <laughs> real excited about but it, here's the good news lost after dark didn't cost that much money um, so that's why you get something like that made and, uh, but yeah, it was like, I, I, every now and again, I, I sound like I'm kind of bad mouthing the experience. And I don't want to ever sound like that because it was kind of remarkable, uh, the experience as a whole, uh, to, to be somebody who just had, like wrote a thing and then saw the movie that came out of it. Um, and then lucky enough, that's happened to me a couple of times now. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's super fun. Like I got to go out to LA. I got to be there for the, the initial screening of the movie. I got to sign DVDs at uh, dark delicacies uh, and, and that kind of thing. So like I, I got to kind of live the, the life that I always sort of imagine reading Fingoria as a kid. I got to do that. And it was, uh, it was absolutely one of the best experiences of my life. It was so much fun. Um, had a, like a real movie star moment where the guy, uh, the guy driving the Uber that was taking me to the dark delicacy signing had seen the kids movie that I wrote. Oh, nice. So it was like, oh shit, I feel like I, I, I felt like a star for a second. It was great. Um, what, when people tell you like, uh, stars are like everybody else, fuck that. They feel good. They feel loved and they feel they feel <laughs> satisfied and I got a taste of it and now I just that's why I, I want a cult. Um, it no, it was it was really fun and it, it was one of those things where, um, like I said, I kind of imagined I would what that would be like. I've always loved horror movies and I've loved writing. I always wanted to, you know, uh, be in a situation where it was like, oh, I was the creator of some horror thing. And I got to, you know, I got to do interviews like this and I got to, I, I got to travel 
uh, and and see the screening and and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, that was that was really fun, and um, you know, it, it was one one of those deals where uh, after the movie came out, it just you know it didn't make a substantial amount of money. It kind of broke even. It kind of did fine, but not enough that there was a lot of interest in a sequel. Um, despite the fact that I've I've kind of got one and most of it's sort of written and and strangely <laughs> strangely enough uh the guy who plays Toby in the movie uh actor named Jesse Camacho who I like quite a lot I think he's really good in the movie and and uh he's just a good guy and uh every like new years I'll get a, a message from Jesse that's just like hey man what's up and uh, he's Canadian so he's real polite and friendly and nice and uh but every now and again, it'll be like, hey, uh, how about uh, you let me read that sequel? And I'm like, ah, no, no. <laughs> and so I've been, I've been teasing him for like three years about this sequel. And, and, uh, and I keep, I keep working on it though. I keep, I keep kind of writing on it. And, uh, uh, but, um, at any rate, yes, it was, uh, it, it was a tremendous experience and, and I'm grateful for it. It was, it, you know, you, you know, like you get such one would think more immediate feedback doing uh, doing music, you know, right. where it's like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to write a thing. We're either going to record that thing, which is not without, you know, the, the production process of that. But it's not it's not making a movie. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, time it is. That is truly a rare experience, especially for somebody who, like you said, dropped your screenplay on a message board. Like to go from zero to 60 like that, you know, even if it's if it wasn't a giant Hollywood movie, it was a very respectable slasher movie that got very decent distribution on home yeah. video. That's amazing. Well, and, and kind of what I was getting at with, with the music in particular, like that is something where you kind of, you're able to perform that and sort of get that feedback from an audience or from the people right. listening to it and that kind of thing. And especially when you're doing, like when, when, you, when you're doing a script uh, or do, writing a script, doing a script, that's why, you know, I'm such a good writer. Um, you're doing, you're but, doing you know, the script. You're doing a script. <laughs> and you know you you're making the movie with the lens thingies, um, but that like that like the 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 act of writing a script and you know as as a writer yourself that is such a uh, a non performative act, you know like you're eventually people will see this thing, but when you're in the process of writing something. It's just kind of you hanging out with you, and so the like <laughs> the only sort of release for I think uh, uh, somebody that's writing writing movies is to actually see the thing get made, and because um, otherwise it's always you know it's right to the the edge of of release, and then yes. you know there is a drawer full of half finished sort of sorts of notions and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, so that part of it was really cool. Just being able to sort of talk to people about a thing you had done and, and, and get their reactions. And some of it, you know, was really, uh, uh, you know, like Hollywood is everything that you hear Hollywood is. And so a lot of it was, it felt very cocaine fueled, <laughs> but but a lot of it too was like there. I also had really interesting, genuine conversations about horror and horror movies and horror movie making and stuff like that. And that was incredibly exciting and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, it was awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's also weird. One of those things that, you know, you don't do on the regular. So when I, when you think about it, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, that boy, it's weird that that happened. I mean, you had a horror movie at Walmart. <clears throat> yeah. I got it at I got it at Walmart. Yeah. You're famous. I mean, semi, you know, I'm like, 
you know, like not not famous in the sense that you would ever get recognized anywhere, but famous enough that I can be like, oh, I've got an IMDb page, you yeah. know, which is, you know, what Z level fame, but I'll take it. Exactly. Fuck Z level ain't not famous. I like a little, <laughs> I like a little immortality, you know, like well, somebody, somebody well after I'm dead, we'll see Lost After Dark, and that that is. That's that's a rad idea. Well, you'll never die. <laughs> never, never gonna grow old. Never gonna die. Going Speaking to- of immortality, yeah. How did you get into the world of podcasting? Um, kind of as a goof. I was doing um a a blog at the time called the Last Blog on the Left. Um. And Jamie, uh, formerly Jenkins, now Salmons, uh, and I started doing a podcast together because uh, we could. You know, it was just like, oh, we had heard that there was a thing you can do where you just talk on the internet. And there wasn't, I don't think it was even an Apple podcast kind of thing. I think it was just like hey, we recorded and put it on the blog. Right. Um, if memory serves, that's going back a bit. But uh, so we started doing that. And then that just, you know, kind of over time sort of uh, sort of fizzled, um, just ran out of steam with it. And uh, and then I was kind of done doing podcasting stuff. And I, I, I was kind of doing just, you know, writing, uh, doing I, like if you look at speaking of the IMDb. You will see this weirdo superhero project called Jake Stevens that it has been perpetually on my IMDb page for like 15 years now, it seems like. Um, and like I was doing a bunch of development stuff with that. And um, at any rate, uh, then Jamie was doing Devoured the Podcast with David Anders. And I just guest hosted on the show, you know, did a guest spot on, on the show and had a blast. It was so much fun. And they were like, Hey, do you want to come back? And I was like, yes, this, this is great. This I'm having so much fun talking about horror movies. I never get to do this. And, uh, so I was on that show for a long time and that's kind of, you know, that was what brought me in for real. Like the first time I kind of, I got a taste and then backed away, and then, like, I didn't get hooked that time. But then I came back, and I was like, hey, give me a little bit more, because last time I was able to walk away from this. And now, <laughs> now maybe if I do it again, I'll be, uh, uh, what do they call it, addicted. Yeah. That's, yeah. What I'm, that's what I'm looking for. Look at that sweet, sweet podcast action. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did that morph into uh, creating the Legion podcast network. So, and that was kind of another, like David did it first sort of thing where he had started it. And, and again, it was a situation where he had to kind of back away. There were just like the, the people and the shows that had been assembled. I was like, Oh, well, it seems like a shame to let that all go. So I just, I asked him, I was like, Hey, would you mind if I, you know, try to kind of keep keep going with this thing. And he was gracious enough to be like, yeah, take it. So in the very early days, it was kind of his thing. Um, and then I took it over and then was like, okay, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it with a website. If we do it with a website, let's, you know, and uh, and, and kind of use it both as a, a platform for the stuff that I wanted to do do as well as the the stuff that um that i really liked and that that people were kind of doing already uh around the network and um yeah you know it was just a you know this sort of loose confederation of of uh of folks who um were all just kind of in the same community and and i didn't want that to go away so that was uh, that was kind of why I took over initially. Nice, yeah. You, you gave you gave us a home. 
you know, well, you 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 kept the home from collapsing on us. I uh, right. We we got some people in to to do some, reinforce some struts. Um, <laughs> we're gonna put in some septic. Finally, finally, some septic around here. <laughs> uh, finally, some indoor plumbing. <laughs> eh, overrated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's it, it's weird, and I, I always try to give that credit, though, because a lot of people will say, like, you, you know, you created Legion Podcast. I'm like, no, not really. Um, I've just been doing it the longest. Right. Um, so, in you know, knock on wood, there would be a day where, you know, I, w- I would be like, all right, you, now it's your problem. <laughs> so. Not it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not anywhere near that. I'm like, I'm actually, I'm, I'm honestly having a fantastic time uh, right now. I would not, I would not stop if you paid me. Um, so yeah, it's it, it, one of those things. Like uh, you, you hope that um, you, you make a positive effect in a couple of different ways there, right? Like for creators and hosts and, and so forth that you're, you're trying to create sort of a space where it's like, ah, you know, do what you want within reason. Like, don't be offensive and shit, but <laughs> do, do what you want. And it's okay to be weird and you don't have to, you know, like if you want to tinker with the, the form a little bit, you can do that. Uh, you know, like, uh, the witch who is going on to pursue some education, um, did Witch versus the Doomsday Clock, which is a really weird show. Oh yeah, but it's wonderful, and and so that kind of stuff, like it, it's really fun to have uh, that kind of thing where I I can listen to a show that you know is is on the Legion feed and and be like, man, that's I don't know where else I would hear that, and I'm glad that it exists. <laughs> You know, like I, I like, like I love Doom Show. I'm a giant fan, and and like, hello, this is the Doom Show. Isn't a typical horror podcast in the sense that you guys aren't going to talk about, you know, or or less likely to spend a lot of time talking about, like, hey, we're going to talk about every Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, like what you guys do and what Cinema Psyops does with like. Well, I was going to say May Matai. I think it's March Matai this year. But um, of like doing more obscure and oddball kind of movies and and the way that you're kind of approaching uh, that material. Um, it's and like I love listening to that. And it's a real charge for me to be able to sort of gather it all together and present it to people and be like, look, look at all this stuff. Isn't this cool? <laughs> Um, so that's, that's really fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. I look, you know, I'm in the back for you guys. You know, this. <laughs> I do. I yeah, do. You don't have a, ain't no surprise. I love me we, some doom show. I, I'm a cheerleader. We create that, that, that content for you, brother. I mean, yes, but also, uh, don't get me wrong, I love I love content, but uh, like I said, I like the fact that it's a show that, like, I never I never knew nothing about the American Scream until I listened to Hello, This Is the Doom Show. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> and and that movie sounds bald. like I know that I shouldn't watch it, but I really want to watch that movie. Now. <laughs> I went ahead and tweeted at freaking Vinegar Syndrome today, like, "Hey guys, this movie needs your help." <laughs> <laughs> they they need a hand. The, this scrappy movie. Oh my god! Couldn't make good, but um, oh but, boy. I mean that kind of thing. Like that's that's the stuff that I like to listen to. It makes me laugh. It entertains me. It interests me. And it, at at my best uh, with the network, I am sort of an ardent supporter. And, and like, what do you need? What can I help you with? How how, how, how can I help you be better? And the answer for Doomed Show is nothing. Hand jobs. Woo, what? finally. Oh, I didn't realize. Um, I guess maybe that was supposed to be quiet. That's that's the real Vinegar Syndrome release. 
Oh, ew. What? <laughs> I'll look into that. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, oh, is that Kansas City style? <laughs> Speaking of <laughs> unique podcasts, uh-huh. uh huh. For for folks who don't know, what is Pick Six Movies, and who is this charming rogue named Chad Cooper? Uh, Pick Six Movies is a podcast. In which my friend Chad, and I'll get to him in a moment, uh, we um, we do uh, a, a set of six movies built around a common theme, which is really just a dumb excuse to examine generally terrible movies. Um, there, <laughs> we don't. I was gonna say we don't go out of our way to to do bad movies, but in some cases we do. It depends on the season. Um, but the idea was we both like podcasts that have kind of a narrative hook to them where it's like, Hey, we're going to tell you a little story like a, this American life or, you know, something like that. Um, but also we like to make each other laugh. And so this podcast is just combining those things where up front there's a little informative piece that's something about the movie or maybe somebody who's in it or something related to the theme of the season and so forth. And then it's the two of us talking for ideally about 90 minutes. Sometimes it goes way too long, uh, depending on the movie. Those Bond movies just went on and on. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so that's the show. And, and, and it's, it's us making each other laugh. A lot of times that descends into just us doing voices to one another. Um, but also <laughs> that still makes me laugh. And uh, and I stand by it, by God. It, I love it. I, I'm a big, I, I, you know, of course I do the show, so I'm a big fan of the show. But um, it is, uh, like, it's the show that when people ask me, like, well, let me hear one of the podcasts that you do. I'm like, this is the most polished thing I have ever done ever. So, so go enjoy. Um, and I, and I like pick six spot a lot. It's yeah. The, the show hits so different than you think it's going to just initially when you go to check it out. And then every episode, the game is always, all right, what's the angle for this intro? Yeah. Because the intro is always something I cannot predict. Like I was, was listening to, um, it was one of the video game ones, um, wing commander. Yeah. 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 Where I was like, all right, I know for a fact, this is going to be about the life and times of Mark Hamill. And oh, I could no. not have been more wrong. Like that yeah. was so not the intro. Yeah, no, it was the the story of the real the real hero, Chris Roberts. Yeah, all of those episodes are just a treasure. I really, really love that show. It's just something. There's something really unique there, and I think uh, the amount of work you guys put into it really shows. It really does. The, from the just your your rapport, of course, because you've known Chad for I presume forever. Yeah, quite literally forever. Yeah. But the uh, the the writing of the intros is just fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is that show is a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> I can just imagine. But but um, <clears throat> yeah, man. I, I mean, sincerely, I appreciate it. It is. It is uh, I, I'm very very proud of it. Um, and and to speak more directly to who Chad is, so. Uh, I met Chad for the first time when I was in kindergarten. Oh my God. Which is now <clears throat> about, uh, let's be generous and say 41 years ago. Oh, I was going to say 15 years ago. Oh, I see what you're doing. And you should, <laughs> you should <laughs> bow down, kiss the ring. Um, uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so Chad, uh, we we went to we went to kid, kindergarten together. I moved in second grade, and so I went to a different elementary school. And then when I went 
to middle school, which uh, is sixth grade or grade six for Canadians, um, <laughs> then we, uh, we were in the same school again. And so then I finished my high school career with him. We roomed together uh, a little bit in college. Um, I, you know, I was at his wedding. Like, like we've been close friends forever. Uh, one of the first things I ever did writing for the public was Chad and I wrote a parody fairy tale play uh, in high school that was then taken around to some of the elementary schools and, and performed. And nice, yeah. And I got if I, look, this is wildly indulgent anyway, so I'm just going to trust you'll indulge me further. You must, uh, but. But one of my favorite jokes ever in a thing was we had uh, two guards. It was a pale ripoff of like a Princess Bride kind of situation. And uh, so in this fairy tale world, we have two guards. Uh, one one of them, I think, was named Frank, and then the, the other one was Julio. Frank was a bit of a coward. And so at a certain point in the play, these two cowardly guards um, are being forced to go to retrieve this thing in a graveyard at night, is the, the setup of uh, at the play. This is all very complicated, but, you know, the elementary kids went along with it. And anyway, so Frank says, hey, we're going to go get this thing. Does anybody else want to come? The joke being that everyone's like, no, man, we're not going to go to that graveyard. <laughs> it's night and it's scary out there. And so Frank's line is, huh, I guess it's just going to be me and Julio down by the graveyard then. <laughs> I knew that was coming. That's fucking, great. Fucking crickets from the kids. Every teacher laughs. <laughs> so oh, um, See, you're just like Disney, you sneak a joke for the adults in. That's right. That's right. We we had it down at the uh, the tender age of fifteen and sixteen, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I've known him forever. Like we've we've kind of been, it, it like he's always the person that I'm on the phone with, uh, and you know we're playing catch up or whatever because he he lives in Florida, not not too far from you. Um, oh, that's oh that sucks. Poor yeah, guy. Yeah. Well, look, he he's got a nice house. Not too hard up. <laughs> um, the guy works for Disney and has for years and does pretty well. He's fine. <gasps> he's fine. Oh, see, I was right. Yeah, no, he's he's fucking sodomizing that mouse. Um, oh Lord, sorry, no, that's not true. None of that's true. Um, but uh, yeah, so we would, you know, like we talk to each other all the time, and during the course of the conversation, again, like we we kind of cut our teeth on stand up comedy and like we like. We were the kids who listened to old Carlin and Steve Martin and Cheech and Chong records and shit like that. So, like, it's just in our DNA to try to crack each other up. And and so that's so much of the show is just like, all right, what can I say that's going to break him up? And And it also works because Chad is very, he's very scripted. Uh, Chad has a lot of notes. We we talk about it on the show a lot. But Chad will have like 30 pages of notes for these movies. <laughs> and I'm like, I've got like six, man. I've got, nice. you know, I've got the things that happen in the movie. And then sort of, sort of the way that that dynamic uh, has, has worked and continues to is that he is very, very scripted, knows exactly where he's going with the next thing out of his his mouth. I am the Tasmanian devil let loose in his plan, set <laughs> set free to try to interrupt him at every possible turn, and it and it kind of works. But it is a tremendous amount of work, but it's also incredibly satisfying because there there is hardly an episode of that show that I can't listen to and feel like really proud of and, and feel like it's, it's either funny or, or interesting, or we had uh kind of a weird take or the movie was just so bonkers that you can hear like how delighted and stunned we are by how bad it really is. <laughs> that kind of thing. And, and I, I like to think that we don't do a whole lot of like punching down at the movie. 
you know, we certainly make fun of these bad films, but I, I don't think it ever gets really mean. And, and that was something that was kind of important to us too, is that, you know, it like joking within a sort of a, a, a loose frame of we're, we're not going to go too far, you right. know, like we're, we're not out to be overly salacious or shocking or anything like that. So despite well, all your accusations online. Yeah. I was going to say you almost succeeded. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know but we you know like the we're, we're about to release the first episode of season 15 is that right i think it's 15 which is a a movie called stay away joe in which elvis presley is <gasps> in red face as a character named joe Lightcloud. his yep. father is played by burgess meredith yep uh it is outrageous for any number of reasons like it's one of those movies where you're like well the racism is so baked in maybe that's not going to be as shocking as i think it is and then it is but also there's like eight other things that are kind of shocking about the movie <laughs> it's it's a real something wow like, it's it's a jaw dropper of yeah. a movie and I've uh, seen I've seen way more Elvis movies than I should have. Yeah. And that's that stands out. Here is a thing though. And and it's something that we talked about in watching the movie is that yes, this is de deplorable. Everyone who had anything to do with this movie uh is probably in hell deservedly so <laughs> uh for their participation in this film. But also, the fact that Elvis is just kind of a charming performer never fails to shine through. And even in this wretched... Like, again, it's Burgess Meredith playing Grandpa White Cloud, and you're like, I can't believe what? any of this was allowed to happen. <laughs> so crazy. I know, yeah, yeah, it's nuts. It's really staggering. But, uh, but Elvis was kind of a star man and I, I haven't watched a lot of this stuff. I'm kind of on the hunt for, um, you know, sort of the best of his comedies because I, I could see him doing a light movie and be good at it. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, he, he was in some good ones. They're not all, um, <laughs> wow. It's... Basically all of his Westerns are kind of dog shit. I hate to yeah. say it. That's it's it's like I mean I'm not uh, I I like westerns but he never made a good one. Well, he made one that was he made another one that deals with racial stuff that was much better. It has been years since I've seen it. While you're looking that up, I will say I think the problem with Elvis in the Old West is he's too clean, and he yeah. just he like the vibe I get off of Elvis is like all I want to do is sing a song and fuck, and that's what the character he needs to play. I believe it's Charo. That sounds familiar, or, but... But uh, the one that's really tough, because it, it's almost good, it's the most painful one, is... Uh, um, Oh my god, I just lost it. I love editing. This will be much tighter, like my buns. Mm. Buns of steel? Bones of steel? No, uh, it doesn't sound right. Yeah, well, you know, around the corner, fudge is made. Anyway, there's one that they tried to make one where he it was like a trying to cash in on the uh, spaghetti western. So instead of actually uh, going to Spain and filming it for five dollars, they stayed in Hollywood and filmed it for a lot and tried to make a gritty western. And it just does not work. It was really tough because you could see he was trying to switch up his image. You know, he had a beard. He was all grizzly, huh. and yeah, and it was it was tough because you could tell. There was, there was something more that he wanted to do with it, and uh, his stupid ass management wouldn't let him do anything. So, I'm curious to see this movie where Tom Hanks is Tom Parker. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll watch that. Yeah, absolutely, I will. In fact, the older I get, the more I really, really like the story of Elvis, if not so much his music. I mean, there's some of it I really yeah. like, some of it I couldn't care less about. But he is just such an interesting cultural thing yeah well i love his movies more than all of it because his movies are most of them are endlessly entertaining <laughs> yeah I, I it left me wanting to see more elvis movies strangely and i've 
you know, as bad as Stay Away Joe is, and it is, I, I still find something about Elvis on screen to be really appealing. Oh, yeah. So speaking of Elvis, uh -huh. a while back you invited me to be on a little show we -o called Hero Hero Ghost Show. Uh huh. Uh, it was the the Asian horror podcast over at uh, Legion Podcast. That's right. Uh, was there a film in particular that inspired you to start Hero Hero Ghost Show? I don't know that it was a particular movie so much as a handful of directors. Because uh, the reason I started to hear a Hero Go show is because I really want to listen to uh, a podcast about Asian horror movies that wasn't always about audition or Battle Royale. Right. And I didn't hear shows talking about my, as you well know, one of my best friends in the world, Yoshihiro Nishimura. Um, I've got photo evidence of that, as you've seen. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and people like him and uh, Noribuchi and uh, Noboru Gucci and Sion Sono. And, you know, like you would hear people talk about Sono in relation to Suicide Club, but that was kind of it. Yeah. And and they didn't get, you know, like deeper into the weirdo shit that Sion Sono was doing. And so that was kind of the inspiration. But also, like I said earlier with Pick 6, of having sort of an interest in, in putting these movies in a context so that it wasn't just... It wasn't just pointing at an Asian horror movie and being like, look how weird this is, you know, <laughs> of being able to say, like, here is why this is kind of a of cultural interest and, and why that it may seem strange to a Western audience, but makes perfect sense in the context of, of a, a Japanese film. You know, like uh, something as simple as like, oh, the reason that they're all the ghosts are pale with long hair and with long dark hair and these flowing white robes is because that goes back literally thousands of years in Japanese literary and, and oral tradition to be kind of shorthand for ghosts. Like that's just what a ghost looks like. It's the much cooler, but sort of equally, uh, or, uh, uh, much more much more cool, but kind of the analog would be like wearing sheets to represent ghosts in Western right. Version, you know. Um so um it was that kind of thing of just wanting wanting to hear you know, it was totally that thing of the, the thing that I want to hear doesn't exist, so I'm just gonna make it. And um, you know, it is also sadly the the thing that perpetually gets shortchanged when I'm like doing editing for pick six and stuff like that. Uh, but it's also like, it's the thing that I will continue to do because every now and again, it's like, God damn it. I need, I, we've, we've all got to sit down. Everybody stop what you're doing. And we all need to sit down and we need to talk about Tomie for a little bit. That's right. And, um, and, and I don't think that's going to go away. In fact, uh, um, the, the episode that we sat down and recorded, uh, is, is finally uh, about assembled and and strangely is about to come out. Um, and Ooh. then, uh, you know, the, the thing is with all of this stuff is where do you strike the balance between doing sort of the Legion administrative stuff and the creative stuff that is is the more enjoyable part of it for the most part. And so, like I said, Hero Hero often gets the short change on that, but it's it's also one of those things that I love, and and you know, it's the reason I I still pull out you know my my copies of uh, you know d d Korean horror cinema, the that old tome, and uh, and stuff like uh, the. The book that Colette Belmain did on Japanese horror cinema is quite good as well. And, um, yeah, you know, it's... Like, Asian horror to me is still the, the thing that 
when I'm I'm watching something for the first time has the best opportunity to get me jazzed. And and the next after all the eye stuff, the next <clears throat> hero hero focus is going to have to be on Indonesian horror right now. Oh yeah. It's, nice. You know, like what Joko Anwar is doing it can no longer be ignored on this network, goddammit. Um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, perpetually the thing that I, I find refreshing because I still think that some of the most interesting work is coming from East and Southeast Asia and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, it's cool. I, I know that's an extremely long-winded way to say not one single movie. Um, but I would say <laughs> the closest to a single movie would probably be something like Tokyo Gore Police. Yes, where yes, I was just, that's something magical there. Yeah, okay, and you're just like, why? Why isn't everyone talking about how awesome this movie is? Did you not see the Umbrella scene? What is <laughs> some dude that has flesh keys for no reason? Did you see mm. the alligator lady? What are we doing here, people? <laughs> yeah, I struggle to to work Asian horror into the playlist, into the queue here on the show, just because I think it's too big. It's a whole world for Brad and Jeffrey. Uh, Simon I, and I have the most uh, hours logged watching uh, Asian horror films. So it's it's just one of those things that we don't get around to nearly enough on this show. And I wish we did, which is why I was so glad that you asked me to be on. Because I lean towards the Japanese uh, obscurities. I really have uh, dug into some of these these bargain basement finds that a lot of these labels that like just exploded in the early two thousands, putting out all kinds of crazy stuff. No Western eyes should see this, but every person should. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, uh, like there's movies that I can't explain like crazy lips. I don't know if you've seen crazy lips. I have not seen crazy lips. It is. I can now, I cannot sit through it. My sensibilities have changed. It was one of the movies that changed my sensibility. I used to be like, oh, this has a rape scene. Okay. I don't like that. To, dear God, does this have a rape scene like every 10 minutes? Yeah. And yet, it's surrounded by one of the most wondrous, bonkers uh, Japanese horror plots I've ever seen. Like, it is truly a horror film, but it is so sleazy that the rape becomes nothing. And that's when it's like really scary to me. I'm like, no, but the movie, I like, I want to tell people about it. Like I'm talking about it now, but I'm like, folks approach with extreme caution. <laughs> yeah. I, <sighs> you know? Yeah. A lot of those are because there are so many of them and you can't certainly keep track of them all, but also they're so niche in terms mm. of like what they're delivering as a, a film and it's just like hey are like there i i can't remember the name of this one i want to say it was called grotesque but I, that's a different film um anyway it was about a kid not a kid he was a young man uh and his mother was doing some sort of arousal study he got oh, her God. formula and was like up in the dosage on the ladies that were coming to her for treatment. And the resulting uh, overdose meant that they got uh, an erotic pleasure from pain. Uh, okay. I, I think I know which one you're talking about. And there is a, a, a scene that speaking of sleazy films, that is this dude watching as a girl uses a knife to cut off her nipples and then her vulva Jeez. and it was just like what in the Crap. where what is happening in this movie now and wow and again it's one of those things where you're like i can't recommend this to a soul no. but also that was fucking crazy <laughs> you know, like the Japanese are just willing to go to places. And I'm like you, I, at this point, I got nothing to prove. I'm not trying to like, I don't need to see Sala once a year or anything. Like I, no. I'm fine. Um, and, and I don't necessarily want to see movies that are really 
uh, overly misogynistic or um, unnecessarily cruel. And, and a lot of Japanese cinema is both of those things because, yeah. sadly, Japanese culture is still largely misogynistic. And, and so watching a lot of those movies is still kind of tough. Um, and, and you just kind of have to remind yourself like them yeah, watching this with Western eyes. And this is not, not the same cultural meaning that we have here. Yes. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and, and, and how niche is this to where it doesn't represent anybody, but this director. <laughs> right. And also that too, like how Tetsuo is this where it's just like one lunatic filmmaker, but it's just that there are so many of these weirdo niche films that it's like, I think that there's enough crossover market or something that, you know, I don't know what that, and and it's something that is really tough for an outsider. I feel to kind of get their arms around is what that, that like direct to video in Japan film market is like uh there just aren't a, go- a ton of good resources about that um as an outsider trying to understand like what is the the shit that like japanese horror directors are shoveling onto not american streaming platforms but whatever is going on over there you know um so anyway it's like but I see every now and again the post that you make where you're like, oh, I got this haul of movies and it'll have a couple of like obscure Japanese films that, you know, in some cases I've never heard of. And it really rekindles that kind of competitive spirit of like, <laughs> oh, you, you think you can find something weird? Oh, well, uh, let's see how weird we can get. Mm-hmm. So, but it, it's fun because it still feels in a lot of ways, like the undiscovered country. Cause every time you think you've kind of, you know, gotten your, your, your head around how, uh, sort of a weird Japanese subgenre works. It's like, Oh, did you know there's also this weird nor, uh, noir sub sub genre of these movies? And you're like, what? They whip some Excuse noir me? on this too. And they're like, yeah, yeah, they did. Samurai noir. There's like 80 movies. And you're like, God damn it. All right. And there are werewolves in all of them. Absolutely, there are werewolves. In oh all my of them. god! That's what, <laughs> that's what the whole thing is about. And yeah, it's it's weird shit like that. Like there are so many rabbit holes you can go down. Um, and and that's just within the Japanese market, much less the weird, like you know, Indian you, Indian cinema. I can't even touch it. You know, it's just too much. Dude, yeah. I have barely scratched the surface. Barely. I feel terrible about that because I'm like, I'm sure there's amazing stuff coming out of India, but I, I need somebody to tell me where to start with. Like, I've seen two uh, Bollywood films that uh, don't have happy endings, and my head exploded. I finally found two that had very, very like bleak endings. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, whoa, it really does happen. <laughs> It's like no, I'd only ever seen happy endings. <laughs> it, was, it was their their version of uh, Titanic. So speaking of something Titanic, oh, I have no segue here. Oh. Um, I have seen you play the video games where you 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 host things uh-huh. where you you do playthroughs where you're hanging out and playing video games and chatting and talking about the game overall. Mm-hmm. Um. What are some, uh, like, what are five, I guess, any era, doesn't matter when these came out, what are five classic, to you specifically, video games that you'd call favorites? Yeah, I so I don't really have a fondness for a lot of, like, the, the staples, you know, your Sonics yeah. and your Mario Brothers is, is here, here's the stuff I love, the, the stuff that you know, either turn me on to video games or kind of kept the fires lit. And I think it's interesting to live in a time where most of us grew up with video games at this point, and it's not quite as, uh, as, as weird a, a side hobby at this point. And, no. but it still feels strange yeah. when you run into like middle-aged people that are like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Super Mario brothers. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Hang on. Hang on a second. I got to, 
I got to pick up some seed from the Lowe's and then I'll call you back about Super Mario Brothers, Jim. Um, I'll do some speed runs for you later, bro. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all that stuff is good, but the stuff that really turned me on when I was a kid, there was a game for the Sega Genesis called Shining Force. Um, that was kind of a fantasy game, but it was also one of those sort of tile-based strategy games where you're, you know, sort of chess-like moving characters around on the the uh the board um and wow. each one had unique powers so depending on where you put them they could affect other characters etc cetera, etc cetera. um a lot of micromanagement with that stuff but it was <laughs> and and it's something i didn't realize until i was older was i was into really super anime shit when i was a kid but i didn't know that so like shining force also super anime um, but all, but a really good game. And then there was a game called Snatcher for the Sega CD. Hmm. And Snatcher was one of the first games by a video game uh, developer and director named uh, Hideo Kojima. It was famous for like the Metal Gear Solid games and did a game recently oh, called wow. Death Stranding. Is a big buddy of Sion Sonos. And uh, showed up uh, a, a, in a cameo in Nicholas Wind and Reigns or Reffin's uh, um, Too Old to Die Young show on Amazon. Like, he's a weird figure within the video game industry. Anyway, way nice. back in the day, Hideo Kojima did this game called Snatcher that was sort of like, what if Blade Runner and the Terminator had a baby? And so <laughs> the game was kind of a role-playing game, but also sometimes was a light gun game. And it was just weird and offbeat, and it, there was nothing else like it I'd ever played. Uh, and, and to this day, it's one of the most like ambitious like early games I ever played. Um, that was really cool. Um Resident Evil 2, the first time I played that, that blew my mind. Oh, yeah. The visceral experience, I, me and a buddy of mine named Brian would play this in college and hand the controller back and forth. And so, it, the, you know, the rule was, you play till you die. If you die a lot, well, fuck, you don't get to play that much. So, you know, get good. <laughs> but I distinctly remember this moment where uh you're killing the crocodile the big giant crocodile or alligator in the sewer and whatnot if you remember that part i do and it took us a few tries to figure out that you had to get the fire extinguisher off the wall and then shoot that oh my god and so <laughs> i forgot the, about that the moment that i think and i'm pretty sure it was brian who finally was like i think what we got to do is get that fire extinguisher and i was like all right go for it so he does, and I remember coming up off the couch and being like, "Shoot that motherfucker!" <laughs> <laughs> like, like some something serious was riding on it. <laughs> and man, that was so much fun. Resident Evil Two is oh, what a what a treat of a game. Uh, creepy and also great, great fun. And then uh, there's Eco or Ico, uh, which I think was a PlayStation Two joint. And that was a game in which you just led a girl through a castle. And it had a really, uh, a, a very distinctly Japanese art style, not quite anime. You basically were, the whole game was like you helping her up on ledges and helping her along to try to get her to safety. And every now and again, these like shadow creatures would pop up, and you'd take a huh. stick and you'd whack them in the fucking head a couple of times until they went away, and then you'd help her some more. Sometimes you would have to kind of call out to her, and there was a button for that where you hit a button, and the character would go, beep. And so you could just hit that as many times as you wanted. <laughs> and just go, beep, beep, beep. <laughs> And that was a good time. It, but it was a really sweet game, and it was also, like, uh, there was really no dialogue. It was almost this, like, wordless sort of art installation that you were going through. Um, and that was really cool and kind of formative. And and later on, when other games sort of took a much more artistic and, and sort of 
experiential approach of like, and there are not really rules to this game. It's really just you sitting down and kind of having this experience through this visual landscape and, and stuff like that. Um, that, you know, I, I think that was one of the first games that taught me, oh, like, oh, there's real art to this and you can you can have a, a purely artistic kind of expression in a, in a video game space. Um, and, and then uh, the, the last on my, my list of five classics is a throwback to the Apple IIe, uh, which was the original Castle Wolfenstein, color or not. Uh, some, of, some of those monitors were color, uh, if you knew somebody yeah. that had some money in, in the neighborhood. And the sound was terrible. It was just, you know, these weird MIDI samples of Octon and uh, <laughs> getting drunk on schnapps and, and, and trying to make your way through uh, Castle Wolfenstein as the SS pursued you. See, I always forget about the schnapps level. Yeah. Hick, it would say. <laughs> Hick. Which I see, Hick. Um, das Hicker. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, but it, like that was the first game I ever played that got me real tense. Because before that, I'd, I'd play a couple of text games that's like, you know, looking well. Nothing. All right. North. Oh, you my know, God. That kind yes. of shit. Oh. And, and, but then you play like Castle Wolfenstein, and it was like, Oh shit! Like there's guns and shooting people and opening chests, and it was like that was the proto game for me, where everything yeah. that came after that was in one way or another a variation on. Oh well, well, what did they do different from Castle Wolfenstein? I remember my friend had that uh, that first Star Wars first person shooter. Oh, sure. Don't remember what it's called, but it was mind blowing. Yeah. So I'd played Doom, and I loved that, of course. And I'd played Quake, but then my friend on his PC had had that Star Wars game with all the crazy weapons you'd collect through the game, and oh my god, like that was. He knew our friendship meant nothing. He knew that I was just there for that, and it was fine. Whatever that game was. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's Kyle Katarin, I think, is the character in the game. And I can't remember the name of the game. Nah, it's not Jedi Forces. Tell me. Rebel Forces. What's the name of the game? Kyle Katarin? Something. Jedi. Something. Mm. Eh. It was the one with Captain Kirk. I don't know. The the one with the Spocks. So, yeah. So, so those are the, the, the ones that, like, if someone asked me. What are the games that that helped define sort of my taste in games, and also yeah. that I could go back and play right now? Any of those, I could probably go back and play, and 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 be reasonably good at in a short amount of time. Right, and that's that was the key for me. Could I play this game successfully? Then I liked it because I'm really exceptionally terrible at video games. I am not great. I am not a great video game player uh, as a rule. Um, there are games that I really, really like and that I can play through and like, I can't play shooters at this stage of my life. I was never quite, I was never good at it to begin with. And now it's, I'm fucking hopeless. (laughs) (laughs) So what are five new games that you've enjoyed that you'd recommend folks check out? I'm so glad you asked Richard. I, I know you, this is one of your, one of your expertises. So yeah, and and I don't we don't have a video game podcast anymore, so uh, I don't get to talk about it in this format very often, <laughs> and that's a shame for you. I'm here to make your dreams come true, my friend. Yeah, buckle the fuck up. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> so <laughs> you can you can step away now, Richard. You can come back in about twenty minutes. Maybe All right, I'll go. Be... I'll go pee for a while. <laughs> um, hey, if it takes twenty minutes, then you're doing something right. Yay! Uh, so, a couple that are of the same stripe, but I really like. I, so, what I've discovered uh, as I get older is I'm I'm a, a real sucker for anime-ish turn-based strategy games. 
And so, uh, Persona 4 or 5. Uh, mm. Either of those. Persona 4 is kind of kind of the classic. Persona 5 is the new one. It's not as good as Persona 4, but it's a lot more user-friendly. Um, those games are crazy stylish and really... Uh, they, they've got a, a great vibe to them, and they're weird and, like I said, super anime. Uh, in Persona 5, you are leading a team of thieves that steal hearts, Richard. They <gasps> steal hearts. And um, it's it's uh, a lot of nonsense, and it's half high school simulator where you have oh, to kind of nice. maintain social relationships and go to class and take tests and shit. But also, you are saving the world in your off time with a group of your friends. And so those Persona games are great. And the sub to that would be a game called Tokyo Mirage Sessions. That's essentially the same format of game in that it's there's a little bit of kind of management sim stuff to it. But it's largely a turn-based strategy game. But Tokyo Mirage Sessions is all about uh, becoming uh, great musicians and freeing people from malaise in in Tokyo. And it's very J-pop heavy. Oh, and, cool. Right, like every, every stage you finish, after you kind of have your boss battle and come out of that, you are rewarded with a three to seven minute cutscene. That is a hundred percent gonna have a big anime music video right in the middle of it, <laughs> and it's fucking delightful. That game is so charming and wonderful, and I and I respond uh, more than the silly and goofiness of the game, which it is. Um, I respond to the idea that the whole game is about sort of like using music to wake people up to the color of life. And, and so it has this really pro-art kind of vibe to it, and I like to see that. Uh, and that's a, a really stylish and wonderful game as well. So, uh, so those are the kind of weirdo role-playing games. Um, another weirdo role-playing game. Um, Yakuza Like a Dragon, which is a game that I just recently finished. And... It is uh, a story, a Yakuza story. There's a, a long tradition of Yakuza games. There's like seven or eight of them. This is the latest. Um, they, wow. they they switch up the combat in this, so it's not a brawler anymore. It's turn-based. And you may have sensed a theme that I like those games. Um, and it's, so it's, this, it's the story of this guy named Ichiban Kasuga, who is a low-level Yakuza dude who ends up going to prison in place of the son of one of the Yakuza bosses. He kind of sacrifices himself and then gets out of prison and realizes that the clan that he used to, that he went to prison for, essentially, no longer exists. And he gets shot and thrown onto the mean streets of uh, Ijincho in Yokohama. And uh, and so the whole game is him trying to kind of figure out what the hell happened and why his old boss won't even speak to him anymore and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's a great story. It's a really fun Sounds story. Sounds awesome. It's fantastic. Along the way, you fight uh, uh, adult diaper lovers. Uh, who uh, at one point who you can later call in as friends. Uh, but I'll tell you, here's the thing <laughs> that, that I, I like most about the game is that every single mission sort of ends with the main character who's kind of a dope. He's like, he's a really nice guy and his heart's in the right place, but he's kind of, he's kind of a dope sometimes. But he's always trying to do the right thing and almost every mission ends with him trying to bring people together, trying to trying to heal somebody, trying to help somebody do something that they've been wanting to achieve. It's never like I've defeated so and so. Every now and again, but but the vast majority of missions are more like, oh, I have done this that positively affected someone's life. 
and you know in the world that we live in now it's been nice to to really get lost in a video game where the main character is constantly like i'm a hero and i want to help i want to help make li- uh people's lives better nice it's like it, it's a wonderful game uh there's also a point where you fight a chimpanzee who has taken control of a giant earth moving <laughs> machine and it's it is there's that there's uh um there's a kimchi vendor that makes kimchi that's way too hot so that everyone who eats it uh basically it sets fire to their asshole and they run really fast <laughs> and periodically throughout the game you'll run into characters that are like you know I just don't have the get up and go that I used to to really make a difference in my job anymore and you're like I've got some fucking kimchi for you and then Brilliant. that's how you make oh their lives God. better. It's it's nonsense and it's wonderful. Um, so I would say those games uh, are, are the Yakuza Like a Dragon is fantastic. Um, those Arkham Batman games, if you if you're just looking at something for something to play that is just going to be super fun, got a cool story, feels like Batman. Those Batman Arkham Asylum and Arkham City games are. I mean, the best superhero games that have ever been made. There are, if you want to feel like Batman, those games will make you feel like Batman. And what more can you ask for? I'm yeah. already Batman, but what? Yeah, sorry. No, oh. it's kind of a letdown now that you say it. Yeah, it's uh... not kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Some other quick ones. If if people are, I'm almost doing this like, hey, if you if you're looking to play games these days. Uh, the the Grand Theft Auto or Red Dead Redemption, kind of either one, if you just want to play something that will show you the scope of what video games can be now, and just like, oh, this is an entire world, and you can kind of go anywhere yeah. and do anything. Exactly. That's Those are pretty amazing. Um, for As a technological achievement, as much as anything. Um. And then finally, a, a shout out to a very a, a little game that I played last year and really loved um, is a game called Carrion. Oh yeah, I saw you playing that. Holy shit! And yeah, it's kind of a, a like a Super Nintendo looking game. It's that it, it, that kind of uh, you know sixteen bit sort of fidelity, but you're playing a mass of living protoplasm what eats people and it, you're trying to escape the lab in which you have found yourself and uh, <laughs> man that game is really fun it's you know it's probably like I don't know 8 hours long 7-8 hours long of that um, and it's just like it's, it's a wonderful experience it's a great kind of puzzle game but every now and again you can just yank somebody out of a toilet and eat them and that is uniquely <laughs> satisfying. Oh yeah, you you know I, how it is when you just yank someone out of a toilet. I do that, and I did that twice since we've been talking. I know. Now imagine eating them. I just oh. oh. So before I, I release you back into the the toilet grabbing, <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't know brushing. again. No segue there. Uh, what are some of the other uh, Legion podcast shows that you're involved in that uh, you'd like folks to check out? Well, that I'm involved in, you know, honestly, if you subscribe to the Legion podcast, that, that main channel, there's a lot of little stuff that I've been doing, uh, a lot of reviews and um, just kind of little side stuff here and there. But other than that, you know, between like pick six and, and, um, doing hero hero and then duncan and Bo uh comes correct uh which is a show i do with duncan mcleish um who you may have heard of he is uh uh scottish and so we kind of based the whole show around me making fun of that <laughs> and it's worked for us so far and uh we've been watching <laughs> the show slasher oh and, yes. and we've been doing kind of a recap podcast about slasher which I try to implore to everyone, like, look, you don't have to watch Slasher to listen to this. In fact, it's better if you don't. 
um, <laughs> because we tell you everything you need to know about the show and we do it in a much more entertaining way. Yeah, but, I, I tried to hang with Slasher. That that show, that's that's a rough show right there. Man, it is so dumb. Uh, but it <laughs> makes for a great show that we do at least because it's it's the two of us uh, both kind of enjoying how, how dumb it is, but also occasionally being genuinely surprised. Like, as soon as you think that show is not going to get any dumber, it dumps it down a little for you. You're like, oh, wow. Okay, so just in the boat, Doc, huh? All right. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> um, in case you're having trouble following along. I do like that the show every now and again, it's just like, hey, remember that old lady from the first episode? But I'll tell you, the first season in particular, uh, I got to contradict myself now that I think about it does a terrible job explaining who characters are and what their relationship is to one another. <laughs> so there was an, it wasn't until the most recent episode, which was episode four that Duncan and I were sure who, uh, the husband's boss was. And it was like, <laughs> I know that he came to this town to be a report. He's the editor in chief, but I don't know if this lady is his boss. Cause sometimes it seems like she is. But sometimes he he says stuff that you would never say to your boss. But it just the question is: Is the writing bad? In which direction? Is it stuff that a person would never say to their boss, or is it just that no one has ever bothered to explain that she is his boss? And uh, it turns out the latter was true, which was nice. <laughs> um. So yeah, that, so that sh- that's a show that I do. That's a, a whole lot of fun. Like I said, if you uh, subscribe to Legion Podcast, you will um, get all that, and, and you can find that, and uh, as I've been fond of saying uh, of late, that and a thousand shows, um, and we are making fresh ones all the time. And some stuff that I'm not doing personally, but I would still shout out, is we've got a couple of new things happening, kind of under that Kill the Cast banner, the Friday Nightmares podcast uh, has... has uh, been rolling and that has been quite good and uh then rj mcgreedy uh his uh, nomda podcast of course not the character from the thing who does bite size cinema is doing a show called the mystery vault podcast which is all about kind of real life mysteries like ufos and big feats and stuff and i right and i'm i'm so down for that i'm so thrilled about it uh, first episode just landed today, as a matter of fact. Oh, shit. As, as we listen, all about Roswell. 30 minutes on Roswell. Um, and then, and then, uh, starting tomorrow, we'll have a new show called The Dread Familiar, um, which is a narrative podcast. It's a spooky stories podcast. Uh, and um, that will be a bi-weekly show uh, coming from a, a gentleman named Joel. So, uh, all of that is coming to Legion Podcast. Subscribe now! Get it while you can, people. Get it while it's fucking hot. Ouch. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that perfectly segues into what about the future of Legion Podcasts? And I actually wrote, I wrote this sentence down, you ready to take it to the next level, brother? But I wrote it, you ready to take it to the Neville level, brother? But, yeah. Neville level. I don't know why. The Neville yeah, level. Take it to my navel. <laughs> I don't know if I can hit like an Aaron Neville high. <laughs> I don't have a, vol- a falsetto in me. Um, I'll get you to do it. Uh, yeah, man, we've been doing a lot of fun stuff. I'm very excited. In addition to the new shows, uh, which I'm, I, again, I'm super excited about because all of that stuff is like, yes, that is exactly what I want to listen to. Uh, aside from the new shows coming out, uh, if you also follow us on Twitch or YouTube or uh, Facebook, and you can find all those at Legion Podcasts, you, we're doing uh, some more video stuff these days. And as someone who yourself has done stuff in front of a camera on the internet, 
I find that stuff to be incredibly fun. And uh, so we've been doing, uh, I'm assembling right now the, the second episode of the Legion podcast list of legends where um, the premise couldn't be more simpler, Richard. You know, when people come up to you and they say, hey, what are the 20 best, you know, Halloween movies or whatever? Right. And you're like, oh, shit, I don't know. I got to think about that for a second. You don't have to worry about that anymore. We're taking care of that for you. So on the list of legends, what we do is we come up with a list of the 20 best whatever. Uh, we, we've already done vampire movies, so you don't have to have that conversation anymore. You go to one of the, the YouTube or the Twitch, and you find the uh, list of legends, top 20 vampire movies, done and done. No more no more discussion, no need for argument. Uh, so we're, we're, the next one will be uh, airing shortly. Uh, which will be on gateway horror movies. What are the 20 best gateway horror movies to get somebody into horror films? Um, so, again, if somebody ever asks you, how do I get into horror movies? And you don't have to worry about it. You get a whole list. So we're doing that. Uh, Duncan and I have been doing the uh, the, the uh, Duncan and Bo Come Correct show, the slash fiction show is what we're calling the slasher season. We're doing all of that live on video. I am desperate to do a game show. Oh. And I kind of know most of how I would want to do it. And I've just got to figure out some pieces of that. And then uh, that'll get a little bit more serious. Um, but yeah, kind of doing everything I can. And, and a lot of the, the folks in and around the network and especially... Uh, Heather and and Scott over at Friday Nightmares have been really, really helpful in terms of doing some extra stuff for like the Patreon feed and, and things like that. So it's, it's interesting because, I, you know, not to talk shop too much, uh, people listen and probably don't care about how the sausage gets made. But, <laughs> you know, as, as you know, uh, here at Legion Podcast recently, like we had Ricky kind of step away uh, for for real world reasons, and he did a lot of shows uh, here yeah, on he Legion did. Podcast, and so he's kind of hanging things up, and and of course, which we uh, we mentioned uh, doing Doomsday Clock, and he's kind of hanging up the Spurs. Yeah, true. It's kind of interesting because I've seen this a couple of times now, where you see people. Sort of like, okay, I'm going to step away for a while or maybe forever, you know. Um, everybody's got their lives to lead, and et cetera, et cetera. But as that happens, you also see the other stuff too, which is like, oh, okay, well, RJ has been wanting to do this other show and kind of serendipitously is, is, is like, hey, I want to do this kind of weird history show. Uh, and so... Uh, with that and like Dread Familiar and stuff like that, you see sort of, um, uh, sort of the, kind of the natural evolution of things of like, you know, some shows kind of run their course and then other shows uh, sort of begin and the and the in that way the network kind of reinvents itself every so often, and I think that's kind of where we are right now and that's always really exciting where it's like oh okay well we're not gonna be necessarily the 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 network that has a lot of like 80 stuff you know like that yeah. was a lot of what ricky did and so we're not really going to have that stuff anymore but instead oh we've got this narrative thing and we've got uh you know the the bigfoot i i keep calling it the bigfoot show which is really <laughs> diminutive but i say it with nothing but affection because i'm like he's gotta do big feed and right? he hasn't yet <laughs> and i want to hear his show on on big feed because I'm I'm a nerd for for Bigfoots uh, all over, so um, so yeah, it's that kind of thing where it's like a very you know circle of life where you see you know and and and, and along with that comes shows that have always been sort of uh, kind of middle tier um, in terms of attention perhaps uh, start to really shine. And, uh, so anyway, it's exciting. Like I, I always have fun doing, uh, doing this stuff on the network, but, um, maybe more so now than I have been in the, in the past, like, I don't know, three, three or four years. 
because it's just like there's so much opportunity kind of in, in front of us. Um, yeah. And uh, and the video stuff, like I there is, I'm not gonna lie, Richard. There is a world in which we have like a block of video shows program, like a fucking TV station, and <laughs> um, it is a world I want to live in. That is the world I want. I want to get to. Um, but we'll see. the 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 game show comes next. That's the the next. That is the next dumb idea you can expect from Legion Podcasts. <laughs> I am very excited to see this game show or be a part of it. That'd be I, amazing. Here's the here's the thing, and you absolutely can, and and I would want nothing less. But so the idea would be that the host, um, because you know we'd have to still kind of do a remote for obvious reasons, but that also allows us to play with that format a little bit. So uh, I'm thinking that the host, uh, and this is what I'm digging into right now, is one of them. Uh, like, hey, you you map uh, a cartoon character to a person, and and that sort of you know it's like basically like a chat filter that you're using, but oh. it's a, but it's a character, so that you have a creepy host, a, a creepy cartoon host for the game show, and uh, Doctor Crypto, which may or may not be his name. Depending on how, <laughs> how dumb I think that is later. I love it. Um, we'll lead the contestants through a haunted house where they will answer questions based around the room you're in, such as if you're in the kitchen, you're answering slasher question, questions. If you're in, uh, you know, the basement, then, uh, you know, you do uh, possession movies or something. Who knows? And, uh, if you're in the bedroom, Red Shoe Diaries trivia it's all zelman king right yeah and uh so but anyway that's kind of the idea i've got and and there's some technical stuff that would need to happen to make all that stuff work but it could and it could be super fun so nice uh, that is like i said that is that is there is the dumb now and that that <laughs> that fun now is the list of legends and the duncan and bow stuff the the uh, the future of stupidity is the game show. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. The future of stupidity. Uh huh. I love it. <laughs> well, sir, thank you so much for hanging out and talking about you know, bow stuff. Yeah i i I missed the opportunity to use the jerk quote of like, who is Naven R. Johnson? Yeah, no, I, I feel incredibly <laughs> narcissistic doing this, but also it any excuse to just hang out and chit chat with you about anything is yeah. uh is always a delight. It's a Schmidt chat. Yeah, it's <laughs> next time on Schmidt Chat. Why do you not call it that? Um <laughs> or call it not about Schmidt. <laughs> I was so mad that his name wasn't Richard Schmidt when that movie came out. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> Stupid this movie. This doesn't serve my purposes at all. How, how dare they not take my feelings into account? <laughs> well, folks, thanks for listening. Please be sure I'm going to bombard you with links on the description of this episode with all kinds of bow good stuff. And you will be overwhelmed in the best way possible. And Bo, thank you for chilling all kinds of chill in with me. It is my pleasure. And, and if folks do want to subscribe to Legion Podcast, which I certainly encourage you to do, um, yes. you can go to legionpodcasts.com. Right there on the front page, there's a whole mess of buttons. You can Spotify, Stitcher, Android, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, all that stuff, links are right there. Yep, and all on YouTube as well, so get subscribed. Absolutely on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, uh, twitch.tv forward slash Legion Podcasts, and, uh, and, uh, and we're pretty chatty over on uh, the Facebook, so facebook.com forward slash Legion Podcasts, uh, more stuff there as well. Yay! Yay! That's quality uh, pimping. <laughs> That's entertainment. I could get to the, the pimp ball with that kind of pimping. Mmm. Pimp balls. Bye, folks. Is that, is that when you put glitter on them? 
Yeah. Where's Exhibit? Those cars weren't real. Those cars were fake cars. What? Sticky Fingers isn't here. He's shooting Blade? Aww. Aww. Goodbye, folks. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show, use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.